Hello everyone. The topic of this video is an experimental verification of the theory of compound nucleus which was done by Dr. S. N. Ghosal on 28th July 1950. In this video, we will be discussing about the topics which will start from introduction, then the history of nuclear reaction, after that principle, then experimental procedure, experimental result, application, merits and demerits, and lastly, conclusion. So starting with introduction, Dr. S. N. Ghosal was born in 1923, did his MSc from Calcutta University, India, and completed his PhD under Professor Emilio Serge at UC Berkeley. Professor Emilio Serge was the co-winner of the Nobel Prize with Owen Chamberlain on antiparticles in 1959. Dr. Ghosal's pioneering work was to verify Bohr's theory of compound nucleus in 1950, which was perhaps the hottest topic during that time in nuclear physics. Since then, he contributed extensively to nu experimental nuclear physics, education and administration in Lucknow and Calcutta, India. He wrote several excellent textbooks in physics which are used widely in India and in other countries. A major consequence of compound nucleus theory is its prediction that the mode of formation of the compound system should not affect its mode of decay, which means that when a compound system is formed, that the mode of forming of that compound system should not affect its mode of decay. And this concept was first tested by Dr. Ghosal, who formed the compound nucleus Zinc-64 by bombarding Nickel-60 with alpha particles and Copper-63 with protons. Comparison of the Xn, X2n and XPN excitation functions on an adjusted energy scale showed remarkable similarity between the curves for a given product. These experiments have also been repeated by Meadows and Tanaka. Now coming on to the history. The history of nuclear reaction has been studied back from 1909 to 1911. As we all know, it was first absorbed by Rutherford, where they discovered the nuclei of gold and platinum atom through observation of large angle elastic scattering of alpha particle by thin foil of metal. So, what is nuclear reaction? Nuclear reaction changes the identity or characteristics of an atomic nucleus induced by bombarding it with an energetic particle. The bombarding particles or the energetic particles may be alpha particle, gamma ray photon, neutron, proton or heavy ion. In 1936, the Danish physicist Niels Bohr proposed compound nucleus model to explain nuclear reactions as a two-stage process. First, a bombarding particle loses all its energy to the target nucleus and becomes an integral part of a new highly excited, unstable nucleus, which is called as the compound nucleus. Uh, the formation stage period takes like about uh, approximately equal to the time interval for the bombarding particle to travel across the diameter of the target nucleus. Second, after a relatively long period of time and independent of the properties of the reactants, the compound nucleus disintegrates usually into an ejected small particle and a product nucleus. So the two processes are first the formation of a compound nucleus and second the decay of the compound nucleus. For example, the compound nucleus silicon 28 is formed by bombarding aluminium 27 with protons which are a hydrogen 1 nuclei. This compound nucleus is excited or in a very high energy state and it may decompose or decay into magnesium 24 and helium 4, silicon 27 and a proton which is a <coughs> more stable form of silicon 28 and a gamma ray photon or sodium 24 plus 3 proto pro protons and 1 neutron. 
Now coming on to the principle. The principle of this experiment is the compound nucleus model which was given by Niels Bohr which was very successful in explaining nuclear reaction which was in uh, nuclear reaction which was induced by relatively low energy bombarding particles. Now the experimental procedure uh, done for this experiment was that the uh, compound nucleus zinc 64 was formed by alpha bombardment of nickel 60 and pro proton bombardment of copper 63. Dr. Ghosal also studied the following reactions where he bombarded nickel 60 and copper 63 to form zinc 63, nickel 60 and copper 63 again to form zinc 62, and nickel 60 and copper 63 to form the copper 62. And the excitation curves were determined by using the stacked foil method. The alpha excitation curves were obtained by using the 40 mega electron volt alpha beam from the 16 cyclotron which was the, uh, as the same procedure that was followed by Kelly and Serge. The proton excitation curves were determined by using the 32 mega electron volt proton beam from the Berkeley linear accelerator. In the case of the nickel experiment, thin foils of enriched nickel 60 were prepared by electroplating the nickel onto copper. The copper was then dissolved by AgNO3 solution. The abundance, the amount of nickel 60 in the enriched sample was like more than 85%. Uh, nickel 61 would produce the isotopes, but uh, it would, could produce the isotopes but only at high energies, at high en excitation energies. So, uh, in view of this low abundance, its effect in this experiment was very small and therefore it has been, it was neglected. And in the case of the copper plus hydrogen 1 experiment, ordinary copper consisting of copper 63 which was present in 69.1% and copper 65 which was present in 30.9% was used. Copper 65 produces the 250 day zinc 65 and the 12.8 hour copper 64 activities by proton bombardment. The activity which was done by the copper 65 was negligible. negligible. But the uh, copper 64 activity interferes with the measurement of the 9.5 hour activity of zinc 62. And this difficulty was eliminated in this experiment by the use of 300 mg per centimeter square aluminium absorber in front of the counter. And after that, the excitation curves for all the three isotopes were studied or determined. And as I said earlier that uh, 300 mg per centimeter square aluminium absorber was used to absorb the radiations from copper 64. The zinc 62 and copper 62 excitation curves uh, could be compared because they were measured through the same radiation. The zinc 63 excitation curve was obtained on a scale relative to the other two. The other two that is the cop copper 62 and zinc 62. By counting the chemically separated fraction and comparing the zinc 62 and zinc 63 activities. After that, finally, a thin nickel 60 foil irradiated with, irradiated with alpha particles of one specific energy was used to determine the absolute activity of zinc 62 by the method which, we, which we, I already told. This was done uh, several hours after the bombardment so that only the 9.52 hour zinc 62 activity was present. Now coming on to the experimental results, it is shown in this figure with the observed cross sections for alpha n and alpha 2n and alpha pn re reactions on nickel 60 and pn, p2n and ppn reactions on copper 63 are plotted. As the functions of 
kinetic energy of the alpha particles and protons respectively kinetic energy of alpha particles and protons respectively the proton energy scale has been shifted by 7 mega electron volt with respect to the alpha energy scale so that to bring the peaks of the proton curves into approximate correspondence with those of the alpha curves now it is clear from this figure that the ratios sigma alpha n sigma alpha 2n is to sigma alpha alpha p n for nickel 60 agree within the limits of experimental errors with the ratios sigma p n is to sigma p 2 n is to sigma p p n per for copper 63. This agreement provides a direct test for the validity of the compound nucleus assumption. The kinetic energy of the proton required to produce an excitation E of the compound nucleus zinc 64 will be different from the kinetic energy of the alpha particle to produce the same excitation in zinc 64. This difference is due to the difference in the masses of copper 63 plus hydrogen 1 and nickel 60 plus helium 4. In this curve, we can see the comparison of the measured PN cross-section on copper 63 with theoretical values which was calculated on the basis of statistical theory. And this solid line over here, this solid line over here, this one, is the experimental cross-section curve. <clears throat> now, coming on to the application of nucle <coughs> nuclear reaction. Uh, we all know that nuclear physics has allowed progresses in many areas like atomic nucleus, atomic reactions, Sorry, nuclear reactions, but it has enabled an important application in energy life, an application of energy in modern life, and that is the power generation, which are very, very, very important in our day to day lives. And the other important uh, applications are related to medicine, that is the medical field, mainly it is used in cancer therapy. Indeed, we can see at the hospitals that. Uh, we can find like different kinds of radiation sources like gamma, electrons, x-ray, protons, neutrons, etc. In, the, in our life, at any point, we have to do some x-ray and then if we go to the hospital, we can see different kinds of radiation. So, then these ra radiations are, you know, this, uh, they are the source of radiations and they are used in radiotherapy photon therapy and BNCT which means boron neutron capture therapy etc. It is used or uh, the application of nuclear physics, nuclear physics or nuclear reaction is so vast that it can't be covered in this video. So now coming to the merits and the demerits of nuclear physics. First of all, let us, let us talk about the merits. So the merit, the number one merit point is that it produces no pollu polluting gases. Okay, so if it does not pollute any, it does not pollute the environment. It does a, does not contribute to global warming. And because of that, it is very low fuel cost also. So the, uh, because of which, <coughs> mining and transportation effects on the environment is reduced. Hence. It also does not contribute to global warming and the power station has a very long lifeline as well high te technology research is required which benefits other industries also now coming on to the demerits the waste matter of the nuclear reaction is radioactive which means that safe disposal uh, of this waste is very difficult and expensive and because of the local thermal pollution from wastewater, it affects the marine life. Now, public perception of nuclear power is also negative. And large-scale accidents can be catastrophic in the nuclear reaction industries. Cost of building and safety decommission are very, very high. 
and it cannot react quickly to changes in electrical demand. So lastly, now coming on to the conclusion, I would say that nuclear power cannot substitute fossil fuel entirely and become the sole sustainable energy resource, but it can play a very significant role in decarbonizing the production of electricity. Although we face a very uh, challenge, so many challenges uh, that are constraining the prospects for further development, I think that nuclear power should be developed as a potential carbon-free energy resource in order to mitigate future problems of climate change and other environmental concerns like global warming. These are the PDF or the websites from where I have taken help or a reference from. And lastly, I would like to thank the Department of Physics for giving me an opportunity. Thank you.